everyone. My name is Danielle McNichol and I'm with Newman University Center for Leadership. I thank you all for joining us today and today we're talking about the top tech tips for remote work life and learning and uh, really what we want to share with you today we want to have a little bit of fun uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about some of the practical things that may help you um, with this change in um, how we are doing online schooling how we're doing meetings and sort of the abrupt fashion in which we've done so so uh, first and foremost i just want to go over a few of the uh, housekeeping items uh, that we have for today this webinar is being recorded and will be available for you at www.nucenterforleadership.com. That should be available for you later on this afternoon to view. If you have any questions, feel free to, um, we, we have all of our resource information for you that will be available on the slides. Feel free to um, ask us any questions that you may have in follow-up. During this presentation today, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A or the chat program. Um, those are located on the bar right at the top of the Zoom. Feel free to put any questions you have in there and we'll either answer the questions as we go along or at the end we'll leave some time for the Q&A and we'll be happy to uh, get you the answers to the questions that you have. And even if we don't have them for you today, we will follow up with you with that information. Um, at the conclusion of this program, everyone will receive a certificate um, for attendance and you will also receive the slides from the PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, as I had mentioned to you on the resource page, the, um, the top line here for the resources with the Newman Public Safety and also www.nucenterforleadership.com. Please feel free to check that out. There are lots of resources there, materials and our stored webinars. And I really think that um, it'll be very helpful for you to have a chance to sort of just check a lot of that information out. Um, I would have to say that I would like to thank all of the partners that are involved with these to make these work. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Nancy Karamanico. She uh, is the driver of this train, um, handling the digital piece of it, uh, the webinar itself. Nancy's a digital specialist with Caratech and E2 Today. She's the founder of both of those organizations. Uh, we have to thank Jen Wren that does all of our administrative work for the NU Center for Leadership and our great partners with Bellevue Communication, Pete Peterson, the Vice President of Bellevue Communications and Alex Dyer, Director of Digital Media. And we also um, are very pleased to have someone that is our an additional true expert, J.D. Ferry Rowe, who is the CIO for Brevet Jesuit Preparatory School in Indiana. So he's joining us from, from afar for today as well. Um, so as we talk about the um, different things as we're going through the technology today, I'm now really gonna switch it over to what I'm gonna call the practical piece of uh, these types of technology experiences. As we mentioned, um, I don't think we all expected in March that suddenly we were going to be educating students from afar, uh, that we would be working from home, and that we were going to be trying to manage a work-life balance uh, from our living room, kitchen, or wherever you may be uh, viewing this webinar today. So what I'd like to say to you is to first relax, to breathe, um, to know that everyone else is in the same circumstance um, that you were in, um, maybe not the same exact factual one, but everyone is from home and we're all trying to figure this out um, together. So imagine different types of meetings where you hear dogs barking in the background, crying children, glitching calls, that suddenly your coworker sort of looks like a robot, your inability to get into a meeting and the frustration that goes with that, sudden internet outages, limited devices that you may have to get on that phone call but your children are homeschooling at the time, video calls when suddenly a shirtless family member wa walks behind your meeting with your uh, office, a child who's hungry, a child who needs their Zoom login, a lost walkie-talkie, or a Lego set that needs to be assembled. Jewelry clanging in the background during a webinar, people eating, 
presenters losing control while they're trying to put their presentation together and they have 100 people on a webinar. And I'm going to even add in swearing parrots. And the reason why I mention all of those things to you is that's happened to us here at the NU Center for Leadership for uh, having now uh, provided webinars to over 1,500 people in the last eight weeks. Um, we've learned as we've gone along. So I want you to know that we're all in the same boat, um, that I'm lucky to have professionals around me to make it look easy, but to assure you that you just need to relax. Everyone else is going through it. This is not gonna be perfect for anyone. And you just have to roll with it. And sometimes you just have to laugh. So I, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna minimize the importance of everything that we're gonna talk about today. But I want you to understand that we are all learning as we go. There are constant updates to the types of presentations. Uh, there are constant updates to the applications. So we're excited to um, share with you some of these different comments as we go. So that being said, um, I think you can all see behind me, or I hope you can. I have a lovely uh, photo of the, uh, a travel experience that I had sometime in August of last year. So how did I get that background up there? Um, so that you understand that background makes it, I can take this um, webinar anywhere in my house uh, that I may need to go to hide from my family or my dogs or my swearing parrot. And so the easy way to do that is there at the top of your screen when you're in Zoom, there are three buttons. If you click on those three buttons, it says more underneath them. You click on those three buttons and you will see a virtual background. When you hit on the virtual background and on the bottom, there'll be some canned photos that are in there from Zoom, or you can click the plus button and that'll allow you to search through your photos um, that you may want to have or place as your background. That allows it to be the, the primarily the picture of you and whatever background so that again, you can go to different places in your home without having your background uh, be showing to people. So we always recommend uh, that one. As a reminder for meetings like today, for example, we have a number of different participants. As you'll see everyone on here, and again, we learned all these things over time, we'll go up to the top of the bar and we actually, um, each one of the speakers will mute um, their microphone and also stop their video. They're turning their video off. And the reason for that is so that you are able to see me as I'm talking about the different um, aspects of my presentation and it doesn't distract as much uh, from the recording moving forward. So again, that's another option of something that you wanna think about. Uh, if you are the host of a meeting, if you have the paid version of Zoom, I would suggest to you, you're able to go into your participants and you're able to mute them and you're able to turn off their, uh, their video. And the reason why you may wanna do that, particularly if you're an educator, is that students often want to unmute themselves and then they take over the screen. And so you want to try as much as possible to minimize the number of people that have access to being able to impact the screen and to change the experience for those people that are watching. So I will tell you that throughout the presentation today, you're gonna to hear, for example, um, that we're going to ask Nancy to forward the slides. The reason why we're doing that is that we've learned from experience that if we allow the different presenters to take control or access of the screen, that often it glitches. And so since uh, we wanna make sure that it's more of a seamless transition among the speakers, we've decided at least through until we're able to get better um, at that or Zoom gets a better application, that we will continue to have one person that will advance the slides, but um, we will be able to communicate, um, you know, and, and move the slides forward through one person. And it just makes it a lot easier. Um, so those are really the practical pieces of what we've learned. What one thing that I will say that has been, um, we, we kind of talked about each one of us, what we uh, have really learned over the last eight weeks and what's been helpful for us um, in our day to day. Um, and my one app that I would add to all the different things that we talked about today and what others will be speaking about is for Android users, it's called Tap 
Scanner Pro, and it's available in the App Store uh, for you. It's a great application to allow you to scan a document, any type of document, and it can become a PDF or a JPEG. And then you're able to forward that in a Word document. Uh, you know, a lot of us have to sign documents and send them back depending on what kind of work you do. And this app has been a lifesaver for me um, to allow me to um, sign documents and quickly get them back versus focusing on the scanners and, and different things in my, uh, you know, on my printer. So it's become a fast and easy resource for me. So now I'd like to turn uh, the presentation over to Pete Peterson, the Vice President of Bellevue Communications Group. Pete? Thank you, Danielle, um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, as Danielle mentioned, you know we're all kind of going through uh, a change in our lives, uh, so to speak, and you know our work lives and home lives. So it's uh, you know we don't typically have all the resources that we're used to in our office, for example, and we're finding we need new resources given some of the issues that our children are dealing with with homeschooling um, or even just um, day to day work. So. Um, Danielle talked about the um, app for Android that allows you to scan. I just wanted to quickly talk about um, those individuals who have iPhones or iPads. Um, you can use your Notes app that comes with your iPhone to do scanning. So um, I put together some quick directions on how to do that. Basically, just open the Notes app on your iPhone or your iPad. Um, click that little button, uh, paper with a pen in it there, to create a new note or to tap on an existing one to add a document to it. Um, the next step is that you tap the camera button at the bottom of the screen or above the keyboard, and then you choose Scan Documents. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then from there, it's pretty easy. You just line up the paper to be scanned with the camera on your device. And um, if the image doesn't scan automatically, if you don't have your automatic um, uh, settings in place, you just tap the capture button, and then you can adjust the corners to, to the document to be scanned and uh, tap keep scan. You can then forward that to people. You can save it uh, to your files in your phone. Um, I typically like to email it to myself so I can save it on my laptop. But um, it's one of those things where it makes your life easier. Again, as Danielle said, you don't have to go to your printer and do manual scan and then stick in a, um, you know, a, a chip or a card to save to that and then put onto your computer. It makes life much easier. Um, and I think if you go, there's a lot of different websites that'll have different tech tips for you. So you can just Google, you know, iPhone technology, iPhone tips, and you'll find other ones. So, um, we came across the need for this, you know, not just with work, but, you know, our kids being able to scan papers. Um, some of the teachers that they have, for example, um, are requiring them to, um, uh, you know, actually print out the paper at home, their, their worksheet, and then write down the answers on the paper and then send it back to them. Well, <laughs> the teachers are getting frustrated because they kept taking pictures of it and they can be hard to read. The scanner actually makes it very clear looks like it's a professional PDF scan. Um, and uh, I think the teachers prefer that than a you know, lopsided picture that's of, a, <laughs> of a, uh, a worksheet that they've worked on and put together. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so the other tip that goes along with this is that you can actually then, once you do the scan of a document, you can um, sign that document or you can make markups to it. So, you know, on the screen here, you'll see, um, you know, what people, they took the picture from the previous page and they actually went in, um, they were able to add text to it, um, you know, their name to it, um, they were able to check off something, then they're able to sign it as well. So what you do is you would tap the document in the note, in your notes uh, app, you tap that little box with the upper arrow, and then you hit markup. And from there, it has a couple different options. You can click text, add the text, or you can actually um, click signature. and allows you to manually sign the document. Um, you can use a pen, like a thin pen. You can use a, you know, you can actually use a um, you know, large colored markers, however you want to sign it. Um, and then you can save it, send it back to the person. Um, if you have a permission slip to form, to, a permission slip form needs to be filled out or anything else, it's much easier than you know printing something out, um, taking it, 
signing it, scanning it again, you know, it makes everything much easier. So that's another tech tip that I found handy uh, in the current environment that we're in now. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we came across, or my family came across, is we were doing a refinance of our home. And uh, to get certain documents from a mortgage company, um, they required a fax number. They could not just email them to us for whatever reason. Um, so some people may run into this issue as well where um, they need access to a fax. Um, our office in Philadelphia shut down, so I could not get there to have things faxed. And I didn't want to deal with going to Staples. Um, so I came across, um, I'm sorry, I jumped around a little bit. I apologize. I jumped to the next one. So I jumped to, I'll be a tip tip four. I apologize. Um, so I came across this app, Ring Central, um, which has a free 30 um, day trial um, and allows you to select a toll free or local area code phone number. Um, and you can send and receive faxes directly from your um, mobile phone or your desktop app. Um, all you do is enter the recipient's fax number and uh, you can attach the files through the app um, from your computer, from Google Drive, from Dropbox. Um, you don't need to have access to the phone. Your computer's not to be hooked up to the phone. You see Wi-Fi access. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you can also just send faxes through your email. Um, all you have to do is go to your email, type in the fax number that you want to send it to, followed by the at sign in rcfax.com. And um, for example, like our fax number work is 215-546-0636. So I would just go into my email if I'm to send the fax there and type, it, type in the fax number, followed by that, click, you know, attach the document, click send, and the fax goes through. At the same time, um, people can send me a fax. So the one I set up was 267-244-9480. I have a local area code. Um, and I would get an email notification when a fax was sent to that number. And it would be attached to my email as a PDF. Um, and I could print that out. I could forward it. Um, and it really, it, it for, performed all the functions of a fax. But um, I was able to do it all through my email and through my um, through my web, through the website. So really helped to make uh, life easier for me. Um, I know faxes are somewhat obsolete, but I think uh, some of us will still come across situations where we do need access to it. And this makes life much easier in that respect. So if we go back to tech tip three, I'm sorry, I jumped around a little bit there. Again, one of those technical glitches. Um, and uh, again, don't sweat the small stuff as you go through these things. Um, so the other thing was, ability to record from your iPhone or iPad screen. Um, this is something I came across um, that I probably should have known about um, prior to this, but I just really kind of found out about it um, as we were in the uh, in quarantine. And it came across as we were trying to figure out how to do certain things and um, show people how to do use certain apps or access certain functions of your iPhone. And you can basically just go to your settings go to your control center and you uh, click customize controls and there's a little plus button there and um, you tap that next to screen recording it turns that on if it's not already on your phone and functional and then you go to your kind of your menu screen and you can get to that by either swiping up from the bottom edge of your screen or if you have a newer phone iPhone X um, <coughs> or later iPhone 11 and you swipe down from the upper right-hand corner of your screen. That, that pulls up that, that page. And all you do is hold, they say, say press deeply, but you hold down, push hard on the gray record icon, um, that little circle there, and you tap the micro, tap microphone. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and from there, you just tap start recording. You'll wait three seconds for the countdown. There it goes, three, two, one. You open up the control center, tap the red record icon, or tap the red status bar at the top of your screen, and you can click tap stop. You open up your photos app and your screen recording is there. So what you can do is you can go through and you can record, um, you wanna show you know, an elderly parent how to do something on an app. You can actually just pull it up and do it on your phone, um, set up the screen recording, follow through, do the app, show them what you want them to do, and then send them that video to try to walk them through that. So it's also helpful in terms of trying to educate 
um, you know, if you want to do webinars or, you know, useful videos on how to do things, it's very useful for that as well. So we go to my tip, tip, tech tip three, or five rather, I apologize, five. There we go. So this is more, um, this isn't really work related, but uh, many of us have kids, many of us are trying to get them to get off their phones as much as they are and all the apps and TikTok, et cetera. So a site that I found useful, it's called Hoopla. It's a free site that you can access through your library card and it gives you access to audiobooks, ebooks, movies, comic books. Um, you can stream the videos. You can, um, if you have the app on your phone, you can download them. It's very easy to get set up. Um, all you have to do is go to hooplodigital.com slash login and you type in your address. Um, you select your local library and you type in your library card number. Um, and it allows you to access thousands, tens of thousands of different um, movies, music, ebooks, comic books, TV, sh TV show seasons. You get five free checkouts per month. So if you have multiple people in your house, you could actually um, you know, get 10, 15, 20 uh, of these per month. So let me show you a little bit about what you can access. Um, so they actually have 13,000 movies that you can download or stream uh, through the app or through the website. Um, a lot of new movies, newer movies, um, you can save a little bit of money from doing the, uh, you know, buying things on Comcast. Um, so you might want to check that out next time you're looking for a good movie night with the family. Next slide, please. They have 46,000 audiobooks. Um, so if you have a child who may have a book they have to read for school, but you're having trouble getting, uh, getting them to pay attention to it or to sit down and do the reading, you get them the audiobook version of that. Some people just prefer the audiobook while they're outside. Next slip, please. So there's 167,000 ebooks. There's music as well. Um, there's uh, comic books, trade uh, paperbacks. Um, you know, they have, you know, my kids are very much into uh, Marvel and the Avengers. Um, so the comic books, they have a lot of newer ones. Um, you know, they have 14,000 different trade paperback comics you can get on there, 700 um, uh, Marvel comics. So um, there's really a wide range of that. There's also, um, once I'm gonna get to this, they have, they have TV seasons there. So I think they have 2,000 different uh, seasons of television shows. So if there's a favorite television show that you missed a certain season on, you want to get back to that, uh, go back and uh, watch them, don't want to uh, pay for them, you can get them through here as well. So um, I found this, uh, this site to be very interesting. It's, it's not very well advertised. Um, you know, it's a good alternative to you know, having to buy some of these books on Amazon or, or um, stream videos through iTunes or what have you. So those are my five tech tips. I'm gonna turn it over to um, uh, Alex Steyer um, at Bellevue Communications to go through some of the uh, tips he has and uh, useful things that may help people out. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, I do believe uh, you can see me now. Yep, wonderful. Um, so, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, sort of creativity and um, essentially, you know, one of the things that's been helping to keep me sane uh, during this entire, uh, you know, pandemic and working from home piece, uh, which is, uh, you know, kind of recording, uh, doing film and video. Uh, it's stuff that I did for work um, or that I still do for work, but naturally, given that we can't get out. Um, we can't be doing on-site photo shoots. Um, a lot of things are really revolving around how we gather video and audio remotely. Um, kind of decided that it was time to, you know, do that in my own personal life a little bit more. So um, I figured that it would be nice. And my uh, small segment here, I talk a little bit about live streaming and podcasting. Um, and I do see somebody asking a question about getting the slides. And yes, uh, there's definitely going to be, uh, we'll be sending this PowerPoint around uh, to all the participants for this presentation. Um, each of my slides here does have read more links. So um, these are clickable links that are gonna take you to some uh, really good recent articles that I found um, that cover all of this sort of equipment piece that I have. 
So um, live streaming or podcasting, um, it really starts with something as simple as uh, you have your phone, you prop it up on a table, and you, you know, hit that go live button on Facebook or Instagram, or uh, you're scrolling through your feed, and all of a sudden you get the little alert that says so-and-so is going live right now, and um, there's, there's a lot of excitement around it. Um, I would say that in the social media marketing world, um, everybody's talking about live, and everybody's talking about what are we doing with live, um, and one of the things that I've kind of found is, I mean, obviously here we are right now, live on the internet, um, but I've found that if you're, you know, can do the live thing, great. Um, but it's not really uh, conducive for all people. And ultimately, uh, you can really, if you're, if you're able to take, you know, what we're doing here, which is a 45 minute presentation, um, if you're able to do it individually and break down a piece of, you know, information from, uh, you know, into maybe a two to three minute video, either recorded live, or you can do the screen recording that Pete just showed us about. Um, there's a million ways that you can really, you know, put together content. And I think in this new world, one of the things that we're really looking at is how we can be useful. Um, and that's, uh, you know, film and video and web tutorials and webinars are ways that people can really show their value. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be you and your value to your business, but there's lots of things that we all do in our personal lives that have valuable information that we can share with one another. So um, I say content is king right now, um, and we really should all be ready to take part in this content creation world, um, whether that's personally or again, for your business. Um, but with that being said, uh, I wanna cover some real basic uh, technology tips or technology, uh, you know, kind of starters uh, to get you going if you're looking at this world of podcasting or Instagram Live, Facebook Live. Now, uh, where do we start? We start with a phone, a laptop, or a tablet. Um, if you do not have one or all three of these items um, and you are intending to go into the live streaming or the podcasting world, um, you're, you're not going to be able to even get off the ground. Um, I typically say that uh, we're moving towards a mobile first world um, in all facets. That is, you know, for our consumption habits, both media um, and other types of consumption. Um, but ultimately, uh, a laptop with a front facing camera, uh, much like how all of us are presenting today, uh, is a necessity. Um, it's something that you should absolutely have. Um, and laptop's going to give you the most versatility. All of these items that I have on the screen here, um, with the exception of the tripod and the mic stand, um, a laptop is going to be, you know, it's going to be universal in the way that it hooks up to all of these items. Um, a phone or a tablet, uh, you're going to get into a little bit more complicated, you know, like, connect connectors and dongles and things like that. Um, so it does get a little more complicated, but uh, the phone and the tablet provide their own uh, kind of very useful uh, features like being able to be mobile. Um, so anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, like I said, your basic setup. Um, most people, if you're doing, uh, you know, a quick web tutorial or you're doing something like this, uh, your laptop with your built-in microphone is going to do uh, a really good job for very basic uh, recordings. That's things like web tutorials um, and things like live webinars. Now, if you want to move into the podcasting world, um, you're going to want to make some upgrades because again, that level of entry and your you know quality is going to be really much more important when you're doing podcasting. And so uh, up at the top here, I have uh, quickly microphones and audio interfaces. Uh, an audio interface is just another word for a connector. It connects microphone A to computer B. And uh, it's gonna allow you to basically uh, do you know, live recording, podcast recording um, with really good solid quality. Uh, I have one picture here. It's called a Scarlett, a Focusrite Scarlett Solo. Uh, that runs about $100 and is a great, Entry level, uh, you know, piece of equipment that's going to get you into the like the the real quality audio world. Uh, microphones, similarly, uh, you can get something for as cheap as you know thirty five to seventy five dollars. Um, you can move that all the way up to uh, you know the four hundred dollar range. Uh, that one that I have there is a Shure SM7D, which is like the 
top of the line podcasting microphone um, that runs about $300 right now. So uh, another option is the USB microphone uh, that bypasses the need for an audio interface. So that microphone just plugs right into your computer, plugs right into your laptop and you're recording snap of a finger. So um, those are, you know, cheaper options. Um, again, if you're planning to just be doing podcasting um, or if you're doing a podcast where you're going to be sitting around a table, um, might not be a reality right now, um, but a USB microphone is, a, is another great way to go. Uh, quick note about headphones. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, love AirPods, love, you know, the functionality and the ease. Uh, but if you're going to be doing any kind of real podcasting or audio video work, a pair of professional headphones is going to make a huge difference. Um, the bass response and the just kind of full frequency range that you're going to get out of a pair of professional headphones is it's going to be a world of difference in your final product. So a uh, pair of those, uh, that's an Audio Technica. Uh, that's a wireless one, but a wired version of that is, I think, like 50, 60 bucks. So, um, additionally, uh, tripods, mic stands, so important in this world now. Uh, make sure that you've got either something that is going to sit on top of a table or something that's going to clip to uh, either you know a, a stand or clip to a table. Um, something that's just going to make your phone, your camera stationary. Uh, it's going to really make a huge difference. So additionally, if you're really going into the video world, um, you know, phone or laptops, like I said, great place to start. Uh, that audio interface is always going to work with your uh, laptop. But if you want to be doing more advanced stuff, um, you know, like high quality, you know, 1080p video, um, you're going to require some additional hardware there. So down in the bottom corner, uh, not going to get into all that stuff because it's, um, it's definitely a level up, but things like video capture cards, um, switchers, which there is some really nice entry level, uh, consumer, uh, you know, equipment in the switcher world, which allows you to be doing uh, picture on picture. Those are for individuals who are streaming on Twitch, um, doing things like live gaming, where you have, uh, you know, a picture in the screen and my face is down in the corner and I'm talking whilst, you know, whatever, doing my video gaming. So, uh, next slide, uh, we'll move on to a quick discussion about software as well. Um, I typically, I work in both worlds, uh, PC and Mac. I actually am uh, doing this webinar on my iPad right now whilst I have my notes on my uh, PC laptop next to me. Um, but uh, there's worlds, worlds of free audio and free video editing software. Um, if you're a Mac user, I highly suggest that you download and get it on your phone. They're free. Uh, there's an audio editing software called GarageBand um, if it's not on your phone already. And uh, you should just go into your app store and download it. Similarly, there's another one called iMovie. That's a video editing software. It's free. Um, it, it's really what I would consider to be um, kind of the, the really great starting point for, uh, for anybody who's looking to get into podcasting and or uh, video editing. Uh, the interfaces are extremely easy to use. Um, for GarageBand, it's really great for making podcasts. You can quickly edit audio. Um, the importing process is really simple. Uh, you can add background music. Um, and for me, uh, additionally, uh, with iPads or iPhones, um, GarageBand is a really useful tool for creating your own music too. Um, they have a lot of really interesting uh, drum sequencers and loops and things like that that you just quite literally I mean, you don't need a lot of musical skill uh to get real music created um somebody like myself i've been making music for over half my life um when i need music for a video that i'm creating um it's really fun to jump into garage band and take 10 15 minutes and just scratch out a little you know 30 second you know piece of audio that is original it's uh, matches the feeling that I'm going for in the song. Um, just a lot of fun too. So uh, if you're a PC or an Android user, I have included links on the left-hand side for free audio and free video editors. Uh, there's quite literally a million options. Um, for audio, if you're on an Android or Windows, uh, Audacity is one of the kind of oldest, um, but kind of most simple and useful audio editors. Uh, there's a bunch more in the links there. Uh, similarly, uh, iMovie on a Mac or on an iPad, um, 
really changed my life. Uh, I was about probably four or five years ago, I went to a, a in-person professional development seminar and had a reporter say, uh, this is the wave of the future. Uh, this is how we're making all of our video right now. And um, changed my life. I started making videos on my phone. Uh, it has completely altered my ability. Um, and like I said, the, the iMovie interface, really easy to use. Um, you kind of just sort of, if you're on an iPhone or an iPad, you use the drag and drop features. You just kind of drag a piece of video. You can put video on top of video uh, for quick cuts. You can do split screens. You can play with speed. You can put titles over things. Um, lots of other just creative fun editing tools. Similarly, uh, if you're on a window or Android, uh, you can check the free video editors link uh, when we send this around. Uh, I've heard good things about programs like OpenShot, uh, VDSC, and Movie Maker 10. Uh, if you're moving into the uh, professional realm, then there's things like Final Cut Pro and Adobe Premiere Pro, um, great video editing software pieces. But again, costly, start with the free stuff. Get your basics out of the way, and um, it's gonna make a real difference. So, um, great. Uh, next up, uh, we are gonna head to Nancy Caramanico. Uh, and Nancy, uh, that's really all I had to say. So please, Nancy, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, I'm here today to talk to you about some of the ways to get connected. So in my work, I work as an educational technologist and really help people to learn to use technology. And it's never really about the technology, it's, it's about what it helps people do. It's about what it helps organizations to accomplish. It's about the education happening in our schools. It's about the wonderful mission and goals of all of the organizations. So um, unless you're like a true techie that like myself, that I just love the technology also, um, technology is really a, a vehicle to get us from one place to another. So uh, I'm going to show a few quick ways to help people get connected. And in my uh, analogy, it's kind of like a, a car, you know, the, the driving, you're going somewhere. So the first thing that I'm going to share with you very quickly is password managers. How many of you, and you can type this in the chat, how many of you this week have looked for a password, forgotten a password, or reset a password? So go ahead and, and type that in the chat if you have. It's something that I know I, I deal with at times too. So I use a password manager that I, I really love. It, it saves me time and I can import all of my passwords right from my browser. And in, in when I set up a new password manager, you go to something, I use one called LastPass. So you go to LastPass it will take your passwords um, right out of your browser for you, any that you might have saved. And then it just will save them for you and you can access them from your computer. You can access them from your phone. And it's really great because it promotes safety. It has a way for you to quickly reset your passwords whenever you need to. You can get that quick retrieval if someone asks you for a password for say an online system that your school organization is using you can quickly get it right from your phone and share it and it's it's something that's nice too because it has security features it will allow you to set super secure passwords the one that i use does a system where you can do a, a safety check and with that safety check, it will tell you things like, hey, you're using the same password for 10 different websites. You can fix that. Just click here to fix it. So things like that. So if you're not using a password manager, I highly su suggest it. it. It helps you get connected. I think of it as uh, the kind of the keys to the car. Second thing, uh, Chrome browser. If you're using, um, you can type into the chat whatever browser you're using. One that I'm talking about here right now is Chrome. So with a Chrome browser, you can download extensions. And you, to do that, you go to the Chrome store, you, you download the Chrome browser, 
you go to the Chrome store and you do a quick search like this button here on the left and you search for something that you need. If you look at my examples, I use these literally every single day and they help me really to get things done. The first one here is uh, one tab and that allows me, say if I have five or 10 tabs open, maybe 15 or 20, uh, some of us, but um, if I want to collapse all of those tabs into one list, I can. It will close all of the tabs and it will give me a list of the 10 or 20. So then I can save that list and either send that to somebody or use it again. The second one is Digo. So right from my browser, I can save a file. The third one there that looks like an owl is Hootsuite. And with that, I share things on social media. So if someone sends me an article that's really good and I think it might help some of the schools or organizations I work with, I can click right on that browser tab with the owl and it will share it right out to my social media sites that I have connected. The fourth button is the Zoom scheduler. Love that. I can right from my browser schedule a Zoom meeting. If I'm talking to someone and they say, hey, let's connect again tomorrow and talk about that next webinar, I can click on that button and quickly do some scheduling. Super nice. The next one, the fifth one with the three dots there, that one is my LastPass connector. So if I'm unable to log into a site, I can click on that, it turns red and it retrieves my password from my password manager and helps me to log in. The next button there is the screenca screencast button. I can click on that and do a quick screencast of what's happening on my video, record my audio. And the next one is uh, one that lets me do plain text. So some super nice quick ways to do things online. And I highly suggest it. Again, uh, that's Chrome browser and these are called Chrome extensions. A few words about virtual gathering tools. So right now, obviously we're in a webinar, um, but there's many ways you can host virtual meetings. Zoom, Google Meet, uh, there's BlueJeans, there's WebEx, all different ways. And these all have ways for you to collect registrations, hold discussions, Q&A, and chats. Um, also with these, you know, there's a free version or a paid version. And in our um, case, we have a webinar version. We have an add-on here that allows us to to hold these webinars. A meeting is where everybody has the ability to collaborate. A webinar is a different thing. The webinar is more like one-to-many or speakers talking to a group. So with all of these, there are literally hundreds of different settings, whatever you're using, you want to get to know that. And some other ways that we conduct virtual meetings is we send out e-blast, we use Constant Contact, maybe MailChimp or S'more or some of those that are used for e-newsletters. E and then some scheduling tools you can use are ones like Calendly or those you would find in your platform like Zoom. And um, another thing that I mentioned here is Audible, which is for books and news and podcasts. These are listening tools. I won't go into these too much. Pete covered those beautifully, but these are great ways to learn, to, to hear um, news, and really connect with information. So if you're, if you're not already doing that, we'll share them in the links and you can do those on your own. So those are some really great apps and tech tips that I use almost daily, definitely daily. So hopefully these have been helpful to you. And now I turn it over to JD. Let me switch. Hi everybody. Uh... Thank you very much for taking your time today to join us, and I hope that you get something out of this. Um, to get started, I always like to give at least one quick tip about whatever system we're using, because there are so many features in the different conferencing software that sometimes we don't even realize how simple some of them are. So if you don't want to look at slides, and why you wouldn't want to look at slides, I don't know, but you actually want to see the person who's talking, if you scroll over to the side, um, you can double click on the picture of the person talking and that pins their tab 
um, onto your main screen. So if I like desperately wanted to see my face, I would double click. And now while you're seeing my slides, I'm seeing me really big and my slides are in a really small window in the corner. That's frightening for me, so I'm gonna turn that off. Um, but that's a, a quick tip in Zoom. If you ever wanna pin somebody so you're just looking at them, no matter who else is talking or what else is showing on the screen, use the pin trick in Zoom. Um, works for a lot of the other apps too. I am known as the technology guy who almost never talks about technology. And so I'm going to try and keep this a little bit technology focused, but really what I wanna talk about is what we started with, that deep breath. We're all going to get through this. Not all of us are going to have professional systems. Some of us are barely having amateur systems. Um, but there are some tips and tricks that we can give you to make your remote working experience a better experience for you, a better experience for your students or your coworkers or the other people at the other end of the video chat. And hopefully that we all get through this together for the next one, five, six months, two years, who knows. Um, so I'd like to start with, an, uh, with uh, an overview of our context and our experience. Um, you need to set a context for your work environment the same way that you set a context before you write up the first paragraph of an essay. And so for us, the first thing I think about when I think about setting up a remote environment is what is your lighting going to be? And it seems strange that we spend so much time talking about lighting, but it really does make a difference. Um, so the first tip, the number one thing, if you get nothing out of this, avoid backlights. Try not to have a backlit window on you. This even um, is true if you have a virtual background. Let me turn my virtual camera off here. Uh, and now you get to see what my dining room looks like. You notice that behind me is really dark. And the reason I keep it dark behind me is so that the virtual camera, as well as the lighting that I have on, will pick me up better and understand that this is me and the background behind me I don't really care about showing. Um, if you can't use a virtual camera or you can't use a Zoom background or you're on Google Meets and you don't wanna pay for a virtual background, keep your background as plain as possible. Um, I have doors here that go into my living room. I don't wanna show you my living room. You don't wanna see my living room. So keeping the background as simple as possible is a good idea. Okay, back to lighting. Avoid backlights. The second thing is a, is a professional trick, but it's a great trick to understand, and it's that you don't mix your cool lights and your warm lights. So your sunshine is a warm light. So if you're by a window and your, your face is being lit up by a window and you wanna add lights, try to add lights that are softer, oranger, yellower, than like your LED lights or your overhead lights. If you're in an office that has those LED lights, those are blue lights. And if you wanna augment them, you wanna augment them with blue lights. And I'll show you what the difference is. If you look at my screen, you'll see right now I'm on an orange light. I'm kind of orange in the background. My overhead lights are orange and my ring light, which I'll talk about in a second, that's in the picture. You can see the ring of light, that's a ring light. Um, my ring light is orange, but I can change it to blue and as I change it to blue, you can see that it starts to do really strange things in terms of clash and contrast and shadows because it no longer matches the overhead lights in my room. So if you can match your lights, soft lights with soft lights, blue lights with blue lights, you'll actually have a better experience and your lighting will look better. Put it back down to kind of my default and turn my background back on because you guys don't wanna see that. Um, Light your background up. You, again, even if you're using a virtual background, if you get into a position where you want to make sure that all of your lines are distinct and everything is clear, or if you're using a green screen, especially if you're using a green screen, you wanna light your background. Um, not with a harsh light, like don't put a desk lamp on it just in one spot, but if you can get kind of a wide lamp, um, like a lamp with a really nice shade on it, um, and kind of point it at that green screen, that gives you a really good effect. And what it does is it lets the computer know where the green screen is because it's kind of evenly lit all over. Um, and so that's just another way to control your lighting. Moving away from lighting, we've talked a lot about microphones and why they're so important. I like to think of microphones as not only our connection, but also the thing that we're going to be using most of the day and most of the time. And so for me, when I'm spending, I run a help desk, we were running a virtual help desk nine hours a day for all of our students and all of our teachers. 
headphones would drive me crazy. And so I spent money on a decent mic because I wanted to make sure that the microphone would never require me to have a headset on. Um, a couple of other tips in terms of audio and getting yourself ready for your remote world. Um, for most programs and for most users, your microphone and your speakers, you kind of want them to be the same thing. So the laptop microphone and the laptop speakers is a great way to go because your laptop microphone and your laptop speakers, they know how to talk to each other. If you plug a separate microphone or a headset in, the headset microphone and the headset speakers know how to talk to each other. If you buy a really nice microphone and you're using a completely separate set of speakers, at that point you're relying on Windows or Mac or, or even your tablet to know how to handle that audio. And sometimes they do a good job, but sometimes they don't. And when they don't, you know it because the person on the other end of the call, you, they feel like they're echoing or they hear your echoing whenever they speak. You've also seen this when you're on a conference call and somebody else is talking and you can hear some rumbling or some noise or some static coming from somebody else's microphone. It's likely that it's the Windows or, or Macintosh operating system trying to get rid of their noise, but it can't get rid of their noise. Which brings me to my, my next audio tip or probably one that I have on a later slide. Um, be liberal with your use of your mute button. If you're not talking in a conference, even if it's a conference with only three or four people, hit the mute button. Stay quiet so that you don't provide static or background noise for the other person speaking. And then unmute yourself when you wanna talk and then mute yourself right again. Um, last one tip before we get to like my layout and, and instruction of my desk here. Um, keep in mind that your webcam is an artificial way for us to talk to each other and know that you wanna position your webcam in the way that is comfortable for you and comfortable for your audience. It is never comfortable talking to somebody who is using their laptop camera and standing about or sitting about six inches away from that camera. That's disturbing for everyone involved and you wanna to try to avoid that. Okay, um, in terms of planning out your environment, the next thing that I want you to think about is your ergonomics. You're going to be in the same position or relatively the same position a lot throughout the day. In fact, what we're finding is people who are doing remote education forget to get up and honestly, they forget to eat. Sometimes they put off going to the bathroom. We're not sure why any of this behavior is true, but we're starting to see a lot of studies saying that it is absolutely true that we kind of sit down and just stay sitting. Um, so it was quickly within about the first week of remote learning that I switched over to a standing desk just so that I could get comfortable and be comfortable with where I am. Make sure that you're not straining your wrists or straining your elbows by keeping them in awkward positions. That 90 degree elbow is a really great thing. Think about your ergonomics. Um, I'm recommending to all of our teachers and all of our students to set a schedule and to stick with that schedule. If you are a person who gets up in the morning, makes coffee, and then sits down at your computer, try to do it every day. And if you're the type of person who wants to exercise at some point in the day in the middle or at some point in the evening, make sure you exercise. And it's great to exercise every day or even just take a walk around the block, but do some activities in a routine so that you are comfortable with the schedule that you're creating. Remember to eat, remember to hydrate because these are long, boring, and stressful days. Take stretch breaks and then ultimately be done when you're done. Like if you've set your end of the day at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., unless you have a reason to be on there later, shut down your computer. Go have dinner with your family, go take a walk, pet the dog. Um, don't work 24 hours just because your office is at your home. Um, Sometimes this will be frustrating for coworkers. I had a teacher who was really upset that I wasn't fixing her help desk ticket at 10 p.m. on a Friday night. And, and she said, I can't understand why you can't do this. Everything you need to fix my problem is right in front of you. And she was right, but I still wasn't going to fix her problem at 10 p.m. on a Friday. Take control and, and do some self-care. It's going to be important. Next slide. Okay, um, video fatigue is real. We're starting to see, again, lots of studies coming out that says this is a real thing. And we think that part of the reason is because this is a very unnatural way for us to communicate. Just think about eye contact for a second. In order to let somebody else feel like you're making eye contact with them to actually listen to them, you have to look at the camera. And that means you're not looking at their facial expressions. 
But if you want to give them the feeling that you're paying attention to them, the best thing you can do for them from a human being interaction standpoint is to look at your camera and give the emotions and the expressions to your camera. And then um, when you do need to see them and you're looking over, the, the best thing you can do is to make sure that your video chat window is as close to your camera as you can make it, especially if you're on a larger screen, so that you can just look like you're glancing to the side and then back to your camera. Um, again, make liberal use of the mute button, use it, be muted when you're not talking, and then do everything that you can to minimize distractions when you're actually in a meeting and chatting. The, the distraction to open up your email is so strong, um, and we really need to avoid that more on remote learning than we do even in like regular, normal world business meetings. Um, just to give you a couple of tips of things that I'm using or things that I'm relying on, um, I always like to think of, okay, what am I doing and then what is the best tool for me to use that? So Google Docs and Drive and Google Classroom have been lifesavers for our entire school because it's how we communicate, transmit assignments, transmit notes, take notes, share notes, do collaborative documents. Um, we are a Google Meet school. I love Zoom. We also use Google Meet a lot. That's how we do, do all of our classes. Um, we like the security features on it. We like the control that it gives us. Um, we also like the Google Meet extensions, those extensions that Nancy mentioned, those exist just for Google Meet. So there is an extension called Nod that allows everybody in the Meet to get nonverbal feedback, such as a thumbs up or hand raise. You have GridView that allows you to see everyone. Google Meet just introduced their own version of GridView, but GridView gives you a few more features, including turning your camera off in the GridView so that you don't have to look at yourself because that's psychologically traumatizing for some of us. And then there's even a way to take attendance using an extension that will capture a list of everybody who was in the meeting in case you need to refer back to it later. Um, my picks for the, I wanna take a picture and turn it into a PDF are the Adobe Acrobat app or the Cam Scanner app. Um, Cam Scanner is free, Adobe Acrobat does cost some money if you don't have access to Adobe Creative Cloud. And then for video taking or screencasting, I prefer to use WeVideo, which is uh, wevideo.com and you can sign up there. Has Android apps, iPhone apps, a web app, and is a great video editor without taking up a lot of resources on your computer um, and has a screencasting component. And I think that's everything I have, Nancy. Did I have any more slides? No, I did not. Okay. No, I think that's your last slide. Thank okay. you. Okay. I'm done then. Okay. So um, thanks so much. So we're going to have the panel join us um, uh, with their video back on the bottom because we have a number of questions here that we want to just get to kind of quickly and we want to get um, some of these some of the folks. So um, first and foremost, uh, again, the presentation will be available. It'll be on www.nucenterforleadership.com. You'll be able to view this in the, the in its, its entirety, as well as receiving both the slides and all of the information um, that's contained therein. It'll be housed on the website, but it'll also be available to you and be sent around in an email. Um, one of the first questions, and well, it's kind of two questions, so JD, I'm gonna sort of kick it back to you um, quickly to really talk about the, um, the issue of backlight versus yeah light to the background and also you know the lighting around you during these webinars can you can you just kind of talk through that a little bit more please sure um sorry about that being confusing as i was like talking about it. i'm like i just told them to light the background and also not have a light background <laughs> um, so backlighting is is tip the typically worst backlighting that we talk about as bad backlighting is the window behind you that has beautiful sunlight coming in and turns your front into a shadow oh, let me the, demonstrate uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm calling anyone out. Um, that's the you thing that you want to avoid. And actually, he's doing a good job of it because his window is actually angled off of him. So he's not completely in shadow. It's really bad if it's right behind you. When I say <laughs> light in the background, and I'm going to kind of embarrass myself here, um, if you look, there's, you'll see a slight glow coming off of my shoulder. That glow that was coming off of my shoulder is because I have a reading lamp. Um, which is the best I could do for this presentation, that is blasting light. I'm covering up the hot, the hot spot of the light, but huh. it's casting just a little bit of a glow on my back door. And that's allowing the virtual camera to figure out where my background is. 
I could probably get away with it in this presentation because I have a lot of my overhead lights off, but when I'm doing my virtual meetings where I need to be able to like read stuff over to the side, or if I'm doing a demonstration for the robotics class that I teach where I have a document camera over, I'm pointing to the other half of my dining room table because it's my display table with a document camera on it. I need overhead light. And when I start turning on the overhead lights, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And the backlight helps the computer know where my background is. Um, so it's generally, when I say light the background, it is a softer light that is pointed at the background that gives you that dispersion effect and allows the computer to know what is background and what is not background so that the focus works better. It is not a direct light that's shining into the camera like you get with a window. Does that help? Yeah, I thank you so much, JD. And I guess I think one of the things that we would add on to that, right, and I think everybody on the panel would agree, is you have to practice with this, right? So yeah. I don't think any of us got any of this right the first time, the second time, right? So we've, we've kind of learned from, from trial and error and, and sort of practicing with, with friends and, and coworkers. Would that be fair for everybody on the panel to, to agree? Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, I would actually say that um, for the first time, uh, about two days ago, I watched uh, a music duo performing a violinist and a, and a pianist performing together um, via Zoom. And they were playing in time together. And I, I still, they didn't answer the question because everybody was asking, how, the, how are you doing this? This is not feasibly possible to be playing with the latency. And what they told us was, or what they essentially said was, we've been practicing this for eight weeks, guys. And yeah. they are top notch, you know, top of their game professional musicians practice for eight weeks over Zoom in order to do three or four songs, you know, like, I mean, and that's, that's the reality is, is if you practice it, you can get over the hump of latency, you know, live performance latency for musicians. So if they can do it, you know, we can do it is essentially that is the, is the concept there. So you practice. Yep. Um, yeah, every morning before I go live, I'm, I'm looking at my lighting and I, based on what shirt I'm wearing, based on what background I'm choosing, um, strangely enough, the different hat that I choose to wear, because I hate doing my hair in this, in this quarantine period, um, <laughs> the different hat that I wear will affect what lighting I choose because it changes how the outline works with the background. So practice. Okay. Um, so the next question uh, really centered around sort of the, the discussion around passwords that Nancy was talking about, um, you know, different password um, protectors and, and ways to to keep those in different types of apps. And I think we had some follow up um, on that. Pete, Nancy? Yes, um, I wanted to share a couple um, things on that because, uh, Nancy, can you share your screen real quick with me? Let me take control. What do you, you want to upload a video? Let me take control real quick, yeah. Okay, thanks, sorry. So. Um, one of the things I wanted to show real quick was that um, you know, through the password issue, I run into problems of my own where, okay, I know I have a password somewhere. You know, it might be on my Internet Explorer browser. It might be on my uh, Google Chrome browser. There are actually um, options where you can go in and you can access your passwords either through Google, Internet Explorer, or even your iPhone. So, um, uh, yeah, I can't show you exactly now because Nancy's still sharing her screen. But if you yeah. go into um, uh, if you go into Google and you click the three buttons up in the top right hand corner, um, go down to settings, um, and um, once you're there, it'll you'll see an option for you know have about you on Google, and then there's passwords option, and right there it has all of the passwords that you saved on your um, in when you're using Google Chrome. So I've run into that problem when, you know, I'm on my phone and I'm trying to access a website that I signed up and set a password for on my laptop, but then I can't access because I can't remember which password I used at that time. So I use that to go in and find that on um, Google Chrome. Internet Explorer has, or I'm sorry, Windows also has an option too, where you can go into your, um, control panel on your Windows, um, type in Credential Manager, 
And if you do that, it'll have two options for all of your web credentials, uh, you know, all the passwords that Microsoft saved for different websites, and also have one for your Windows credentials. And finally, um, if you're set up, a, set up a, an account on your phone, you're trying to access it on your laptop, you can access it through your phone by going on your iPhone anyway. We're going to start your settings app. Um, and if you tap passwords and accounts there, um, it'll have all of your different, it might ask you for your, your ID again to log in again. It'll have all of your uh, website and app passwords there as well. So, you know, it's a way to find, you know, your, your website, your passwords on different um, devices you may be using when you want to access them on a different program as well. So those are some things I found helpful on that. Um, and uh, one, one of the other questions that was um, on here had to do with the, um, the Zoom settings and the background. What I will tell people is that while we're in this webinar, um, many of the people will probably not be able to change their background. We are able to do that because we are actually in um, as uh, people that are um, sort of participating were the panelists. Um, so you would have to go in when you're not in this webinar right now, you'll go into your Zoom account and you'll be able to follow the instructions under more virtual backgrounds and go through the process. So I just wanted people to know um, that, that you're not able to do it in this format. Um, I, I'm able to do that simply because, again, I'm in as a panelist. Um, One thing on that, uh, Danielle, too. Um, I cannot do background um, on my computer just because my uh, graphics card uh, does not support it. Um, so when I try to do it, you just can't see half my face. So I just want people to know that it may not necessarily be you that is the problem. It could be your computer and your hardware that's the problem. Absolutely correct. I couldn't do it on my iPhone 7 either, but then I got an upgrade recently because it was just past its, past its time. And I got an iPhone 11. Now I can do backgrounds on that. But when I'm doing webinars, I prefer to do it on my laptop just because it's easier. So, just, yeah. you know, it may not also, be you, it may be the hardware. And also, while it's not necessarily as fun to be able to choose any background that you want, um, in terms of creating a neutral background, it doesn't take a lot for you to think about what is behind you and what's going to be like featured. You know, the, the over the shoulder single sign, like we've got one of our participants doing is a great thing to do. Any kind of neutral shot of a wall um, can help a lot. And then there's other places, and um, Pinterest has a lot of these examples, where you can take like an old t-shirt and some hangers, and you can create a background just behind your chair um, that gives you a nice neutral background. And sometimes that nice neutral background is all you need even on an older computer to let the chroma key do its magic in Zoom, because um, it'll think it's a green screen or a blue screen. So again, it takes some experimentation if you don't have the Zoom able to do it automatically for you, but it, you can create that neutral effect um, to make it um, less jarring for your webinar participants. Yep. Uh, well, we wanna thank everyone. We've gone over our time a little bit today. Um, I, we do apologize for that. Um, we, everyone will be receiving, uh, again, uh, certificates of completion um, at the conclusion of this. If you have any further questions um, available, you can see it right in front of you there, Newman University Center for Leadership. Uh, the email is there for someone that someone will get back to you. If you have any questions through Bellevue Communications, which here is Pete and Alex, feel free to email them at bellevuepr.com. Nancy Caramanico is www.e2today.com. And of course, Nancy has all of her additional at and Kara and at E2 Today on there as well. Social uh, media, we got to get that in there. Yeah, we always have to get. So we want to thank everyone. Um, and you know, there's one final question. If you want to take a look real quick, about um, people can only see one person who's speaking when using Zoom. Uh, uh, if you go to the bottom and you can expand that out on the bottom. So if you see on the bottom there, just click on the plus sign, and you should be able to move the people across the bottom of your screen. I'll say also there's a, if you're on a MacBook Air, you might be looking for the gallery view button. Um, that's going to be, I, I, depending on the computer, it's sometimes it's up on the right hand side, sometimes it's on the left hand side. Um, but you want to click that gallery view button and um, that should get you to the grid view or where you can see everyone versus the, that active speaker mode, which is what you're talking about. You're only seeing one person on the screen at a time. 
Sure. sure. And again, you really have to um, play around with these uh, when you're doing them. Uh, again, please practice. Uh, we have had a lot of practice. Um, and again, even with all of that, as you can see, sometimes the slides jump, the screens change, those things kind of happen. So we get back to what we talked about originally. Breathe, relax, um, everybody's in the same boat. Uh, you know, we're excited today as we were actually um, on the webinar, there was a, an announcement today that Zoom is going to have 500 software engineers uh, that are going to be coming to Pittsburgh and Phoenix to do more R&D to help continue to expand this platform. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, pretty exciting uh, stuff here for Pennsylvania as well. So again, I thank everyone that participated. Uh, you've got a great team of experts here um, to provide advice. Thank you for your time. Be safe, be well, and uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.